Just a quick introduction again. My name is Dr. Sean Allison. Uh, I'm a veterinarian with Cleveland Equine Clinic. I've been a vet for just shy of 10 years. Um, my father was an equine vet. My mother's side of the family did hunter jumpers, and my wife is a three day eventer and coach. So, um, kind of horses are what I live and breathe. So, um, I hope that you guys enjoy this lameness talk. Again, I tried to get as many real life pictures, examples, x-rays, stuff like that as I could. Most of this stuff is either stuff I took pictures of or I pulled off of our databases and stuff like that. Most of it is from, from our clinic or me. There's some things I pulled off the internet. but um, So all this is real life stuff. Um, again, if, you, if I don't cover something or you have questions, kind of make a list and then we'll go over everything at the end and I'll do as much as I can to answer that or, 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 or explain or expound upon. So um, I guess with that, we'll, we'll get started. Maybe you can start, okay. Okay, so first thing we're gonna talk about is navicular disease or navicular syndrome. I think everyone's probably heard of this in some way, shape or form. Um, and what this is, is it's a, it's a multitude of things that can go wrong that we kind of localize to the back or heel region of the foot. Um, it typically involves some sort of inflammation or degeneration of the navicular bone, which everyone thinks from navicular disease, navicular bone. But there's, there's other factors that we put into it, including tendons, ligaments, bursas, and things like that. Um, it is most commonly seen in the front feet, 100%. Uh, I, you can see it in the hind feet, but most commonly it's in the front feet. There is uh, a lot of research and, and strength that there could be a genetic to component to it. So if you have like a bunch of horses that are bred from the same mare and stallion that all have navicular disease, you might wanna be concerned that something's not going right in there. You might wanna change up your breeding. Um, confirmation uh, can also play a part in it. Uh, horses that have long toes, lower underrun heels, uh, real broken back hoof pastern axes. This all puts extra strain on not only the navicular bone, but a bunch of all the structures on the back of the foot, which you're gonna see here. Um, it can affect one or both limbs. It is not uncommon to have horses that have it in both front limbs. Um, one of the more common things that I wanna run across for lameness stuff is people come to me and like, they're like, my horse has been lame left front. And then I look at the horse, I'm like, well, it's lame right front today. And they get like all discouraged and oh, am I messing it up? Did I not know what was going on? But a lot of times that's because both legs hurt. So at any given point in time, you may see the lameness in one leg versus the other. That's, that's not an uncommon thing to run across. Um, and it can switch, switch back and forth. You know, I've had people say, oh, my trainer says the left, but then I was over in my farrier, watched the horse go and it was right. They could, everyone could be right. People don't necessarily have to be wrong. Um, if they're not actually lame, um, they will have a little bit of a head bob or sometimes or a, a choppy gait, I mean, or like a short, so they're like a little kind of short stabby instead of being a nice flowing gait. Um, one thing I'll notice in these horses is they like to build up the bedding in their stalls and it gets their heels up. So it raises their heel angle. They artificially bring up their heels. So it puts less pressure on the back of the foot. Um, these are just a couple of examples of navicular bones. Just, I put random pictures everywhere as much as I could. Um, but like the top right is a bunch of degeneration. And if you look at the bottom edge there, it's real rough. So you can imagine if there's a tendon going across that, that'd be like a butter knife on a rope. That one that has a hole in it, that's just a big cyst. Um, you know, like I said before, it's not just the navicular bone that goes into navicular disease and navicular syndrome. Um, there is such a close relationship of so many structures. Uh, and this was a really nice picture because it kind of highlighted that, but you know, you have your navicular bone, you have your coffin bone. So everything says navicular disease. Well, I think of just this guy, but you have your coffin bone. You have what's called the impar ligament that attaches the, uh, the navicular bone to the coffin bone. Well, I'm trying to move my thing out of the way so I can see all these pictures better. Um, you have the deep digital flexor tendon, which is something that we commonly see involved with navicular disease. The navicular bursa, so it's like a little jelly sac in there and it kind of helps everything glide. It kind of gives a little bit of cushion. Um, that can be angry. There's collateral ligaments of the suspensory or of the navicular bone and those can cause issues. So it's not just this guy, there's so many other things involved. 
So how do we diagnose these issues? So, you know, first you do a good lameness workup. We may do some sort of diagnostic nerve blocking to tell us where the pain's coming from. But from there, we can do things like x-rays of feet. Um, you can even ultrasound. Uh, it's sometimes difficult, but you can do it. And then on the bottom right is an MRI, which stands for magnetic resonance imaging. So by doing that, you can see bone, you can see joints, you can see cartilage, you can see tendons, you can see ligaments, you see everything in the foot. So it's not just an x-ray, there's only bone. Um, that picture with the MRI is actually at our clinic. That's a standing MRI. So you actually don't have to put the horses under general anesthesia and put them in there. You just sedate them and they just kind of stand there and they hang out and we do it. Then as soon as you're done, you just walk out. So it's really cool that we can do that standing. And it gives you a lot of information. These are just a bunch of x-rays of, of what normal and abnormal can look like. So your top middle picture, that's a normal navicular bone on what we call a skyline view. If you look to the left of it, where the arrows go, see how it looks like it's kind of darker, kind of like lytic, or it's not there as much. So again, you gotta remember on this picture, the tendon runs right along this surface. So you can imagine if this bone is hurt, that tendon can be hurt. Think about like a noisy neighbor. If you live right next to your neighbor and they're really noisy, you're gonna hear the noise. So same idea. If this neighbor is not happy, the neighbor next door might not be happy. Um, the bottom left, the arrows point to that little black circle on the navicular bone, that's a navicular cyst. Uh, and the one on the right is kind of a quote unquote normal. So those are just x-ray forms of what navicular disease can look like. There's a bunch of other things that can look like though. These are MRIs. Um, so that cool machine we said you can just stick a horse into. Um, and the arrows just show it, it's kind of cool because the MRI looks a little bit like an x-ray where you can kind of make out bones and stuff. But like the on the left, the black line going down all the way, that's the tendon. So you can actually see tendons on this. The arrow is pointing to the navicular bone. If you see kind of that white spot that breaks up the black, that's probably a cyst. Um, and you can kind of see variations of that on the other two pictures. So that's kind of like what MRIs look like, just like they use in people. We use the same type of science. So it's pretty cool. Um, so how do you fix that stuff? There is a wide range of things. So um, some of the things you probably guys have heard of is giving your horse an NSAID like Bute or Banamine or Equiox. Um, there's a drug called Isoxaprine, and what that does is it just brings lots of blood flow to the foot, and that helps the foot um, heal and do better. We can do cool things like stem cells. So we can inject stem cells um, around that, and that can make it heal up. Um, you can inject with different steroids or other drugs. Obviously, corrective shoeing is a big deal when people talk about navicular disease. And there's also things called biphosphonates. Probably the one you would maybe have heard of is called osphos. Um, and so what happens is in the body, and this doesn't matter if you're a horse or a person or a dog or a cat or a rat, you have bone that's kind of being broken down and you have bone that's being built up. This happens all the time. Right now, when you're sitting here listening to me talk, this happens. It happens when you sleep, it happens when you eat, it happens when you run. What this drug does is kind of tries to help balance those things out because in certain forms of navicular disease, too much bones being broken down and not being built back up. Um, I put stars next to the other one called a neurectomy. Uh, we'll talk about that next slide, I think. Uh, a couple slides. Um, so shoeing. Um, like a lot of problems we find in horses, there's no necessarily one correct answer to things. And navicular disease is probably a perfect example of that. Shoeing is super important. So like we talked about, um, their conformation, their angle, their where their toes at, where the heels at, all plays a role in that stuff. If you remember that picture that we showed you. And if you think about the anatomy that Dr. Uh, Gebhardt talked about, like everything's so close together. So you wanna have them up. So sometimes you use shoes that have like raised heels. Sometimes you use pads that have raised heels. Um, people will use shoes like these that are kind of like what they call natural balance or rocker so they can break over easier. Um, they'll put frog supports on it, which is what that lower picture is, the kind of heart shaped thing uh, around the frog. So it puts pressure on the frog. So there's no one answer to this, but the big things are you wanna have a good angle, which regardless of having a problem, you wanna have a good angle and good balance. You want the foot to break over easier, um, but it's more important, like my point there at the bottom is to fix the problem, not necessarily what you do with your shoeing. So your horse maybe have different shoes than your friend's horse for the same problem. It doesn't mean one's right and one's wrong. It's just as long as they're actually fixing the problem. So the neurectomy thing I talked about, what that is, is um, you actually cut the nerves to the feet. And that's what this person's doing in this picture. I mean, you can do it standing just like this. This is how we do it. Um, 
So you just sedate the horse and you make the foot numb and then you can take nerves that go to the foot and you can cut them. Um, but this isn't something you just do all the time. Um, not all horses are good for this, uh, to have this done, meaning the disease problem they have might not apply for this type of treatment because this does not stop the disease. This doesn't help it. It makes it so the horse can't feel it, um, which means it's still going on. So if you have problems with just the bone, your horse would be a candidate for this. If your horse had problems, say, with the tendon, again, if we think about how the tendon kind of wraps underneath there and kind of slings the navicular bone, if that tendon is injured and the horse can't feel its foot and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse, it can actually do a whole bunch more damage to the tendon than you're even in a worse spot. So this is something that's done, but it, not every horse should get this done. Uh, next disease is side bone. Um, and basically what this is, is there's two cartilages within the foot um, that are usually kind of soft and spongy, but they can basically turn to bone is what they do, or they, they calcify or mineralize. Um, this is not something that happens right away. It happens over time. Um, you can feel your horse's collateral cartilages, which is what these are, um, that have turned to bone, but in the normal horses, they're kind of spongy. Um, you can feel them kind of at the back of the heels, kind of to the sides. Um, they will be like these kind of little spongy things you can push down. Um, if they turn to bone, they get a lot harder and sometimes they're easier to feel. Um, this can occur in any breed of horse, but um, for sure, like your heavier breed horses, your drafts, your percherons, your halflingers, they always have these on x-ray. Um, but quarter horses, thoroughbreds, uh, warm bloods, they can all have them. Um, the kind of nice thing about this is, although these can look very scary if you take an x-ray of a horse's foot, um, they don't usually cause lameness. It's very infrequent, at least in my experience, that these actually cause problems. So the x-ray is of a horse's foot. I don't know why the horse was x-rayed, um, but it has side bones. So, and obviously the one on the outside or the left side of your screen is way bigger than this one. So you got to imagine going past the smaller one, there's still cartilage going on, but cartilage doesn't show up on x-ray because it's not dense enough. So you have to kind of imagine there's more, there's, there's more cartilage there just didn't turn into bone. They have different grading scales for this. So you can grade it depending on how high it goes. So if you kind of look at the scale on your left, we'll use that one just for this example. You know, in reality, this horse is probably like a grade five because it all goes all the way to the middle of your second pastern bone. Um, but again, as ugly as these look, these don't usually cause problems. So like if I'm doing a pre-purchase exam and I see these on a horse's feet x-rays, I don't get worried about it. Like I don't say, oh gosh, this horse is not good. Don't buy this horse, it's terrible. That's not how that works. So they kind of look scary, but they don't really have much of a lameness problem, which is good, but you should still know about them because they do show up often. Ring bone. Um, basically what this is, is osteoarthritis of either the proximal interphalangeal joint or the pastern joint. So that's between the first and second pastern bone. That's known as high ring bone, or there is a uh, osteoarthritis of the, what they call the distal interphalangeal joint or the coffin joint, which is between the second and third pastern bone. Um, that one is less common, but it can cause more lameness issues, but they both can cause lameness issues. Um, these diseases, unlike the side bone, are more of a problem for horses. This can make them lame. This can make them not do well for you. Um, and as this progresses this arthritis, sometimes the joint cartilage can actually degrade and the joint will kind of collapse on itself. Um, and when that happens, they can get even more painful, uh, more lame, and this can be like a chronic lame issue. Some horses kind of have to be retired from this. Um, some of them can't kind of do what they were supposed to do and they're kind of done with their careers. Um, it can actually occur in both the hind or front limb. Um, and horses can have this at a very young age, um, which usually means there's some sort of a developmental problem or something maybe when they were younger that caused this or a bad injury. Uh, horses that break their pasterns and someone fixes them with screws and stuff, sometimes secondarily they get arthritis and again, they, 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 they can get lame from that. Um, you know, poor confirmation, going back to our previous uh, confirmation lecture can obviously cause this. So short and upright pasterns can definitely cause it. Um, bad balance, so they're teetered one way or the other because you put abnormal stresses and strains on the joints and that can cause this to happen. Um, like I said, young horses, that's usually a developmental disease. Um, and they can even get like cysts or like black spots in the bone too from it. So 
these are just two simple examples of it. So on the left, um, the arrow is pointing to your, your proximal interphalangeal joint, which is again between your um, first and second pastern bone. And you can see there's all this extra bone here that shouldn't be there. And it's almost like it's trying to touch. So what it does is if arthritis gets bad enough, say in this pastern, it tries to bridge itself. And the reason is it wants to try and lock itself off so the joint doesn't move. So if the joint doesn't move, the body's trying to make it more solid. It's hoping that if by not moving, it doesn't hurt. That's kind of end stage. Um, the right picture, that's in the coffin joint. So again, it's not as commonly seen, but it can cause a lot of lameness issues. But truthfully, these are both high and low ring bone um, are definitely issues when we find them in horses. These things, if I say I found on a pre-purchase exam, I'd be much more worried about how the horse would be, um, especially for future use and things like that. Um, what's kind of cool too is, say horses have like the one, like the picture on the left, they can actually surgically um, basically eliminate this joint. So they actually go in there and you can remove the cartilage and all that stuff. And you kind of put the two bones together and then you can use a combination of like bone screws or plates and make it all one piece. And lots, and sometimes when you do that to horses, kind of artificially you fuse the joint, they don't hurt as bad and they can go back to work. But that's, but that's not always. Um, but definitely this is a disease that causes a lot of problems for us. Uh, splints. I'm sure everyone that is listening to this lecture probably has a horse that's had splints or you've seen splints or your friend's horse has splints. Um, and basically what these are are hard lumps that appear between the splint bones and the cannon bone, and either on the inside or the outside, the front legs or the hind legs. Um, if you remember from your lectures from uh, earlier on, um, each cannon bone actually has two splint bones. So you actually have eight overall. Um, and they are attached to the cannon bone by little ligaments, particularly as it goes down farther. Um, and what happens if, you, if your horse gets kicked, it hits a wall, um, or maybe there's uh, abnormal stresses due to conformation, that ligament in there can get inflamed. And then as it heals, it builds calcium or basically bone. Um, the reason that is, is when the body has an injury and it tries to heal it, it says, I need to make this as strong as possible. It makes bone because for the body, bone is the most uh, solid structure it can do. Um, and then as it does that, you start to get that lump. And then people say, oh, I got a splint. Um, initially, if it gets hurt, um, they're, a lot of times they're hot, they can be swollen, they're soft, um, and they can be painful and they can cause your horse to be lame initially, uh, for sure, especially at the trot. It's pretty uncommon for them to be lame at the walk, but at the trot, they can definitely be lame. Um, but the nice thing is as you cool them out, as they say, or as they kind of quiet down and the inflammation goes away, um, they'll just kind of get hard, but they don't hurt them anymore. One way they can cause problems kind of more longer term is um, if they become what they call blind splints. And uh, instead of kind of growing outwards between the cannon bone and the splint, they grow inwards. So you can't see them, which is why they call it blind. Um, the problem with that is, is in between the splint bones and then the cannon bone, you have lots of important structures like the suspensory ligament. Um, you have nerves and vessels. And so you can imagine if that suspensory and those nerves are kind of boxed in there, if more bone starts to crowd it, it starts to hurt. So that can be a problem. Um, but, those, but that more commonly, they, they kind of grow out and you see them. They look scary, but truthfully, long-term, they're not a big deal. They're just kind of a blemish to your horse, which is nice. Uh, definitely more overrepresented in young horses, um, especially horses that are doing heavy loads, um, you know, you think about quarter horses that are doing tight circles like the rainers and stuff like that, or um, jumpers, hunters, um, especially race horses, uh, thoroughbreds and standard breds, they love to get splints. They're working hard at a younger age. They're stressing their body and that happens. Um, and again, getting kicked, getting uh, hit by something, you know, kicking the gate, those can also cause us just the trauma of it. Um, conformational abnormalities can always do that. You know, if you remember us talking about like horses that are bench knee or they're kind of close at the knee or they're bowed out at the knees, you put abnormal stresses on one side of the leg or the other, then that splint may react because of that. Um, definitely towing in or out is another one you'll see it. Um, and remember if we talked about, you know, with the confirmation, if they tow out, 
which is one thing that can cause it. They like to swing their legs in. And if they wing in, they can occasionally hit the other leg. So they can actually traumatize themselves and cause a splint. So these are just a couple examples of the bone, what an x-ray looks like and what the horse looks like. So the left, the arrow is pointing to the splint. Um, you can kind of see that bulge there coming off of it. Um, the far right picture is what that's gonna look like. This isn't the same horse, but you get the idea. Um, and they can have more than one bump, if you will, or splint. Um, there are some horses that get a couple of them. Um, and that's not a big deal. Even if you have a couple versus one, they still aren't usually a big deal long-term. Um, there's lots of ways you can deal with these. Most of the time, just cooling them out. So, you know, putting cold ice water or, or wraps on them, giving them butte or something to help cool, cool it out. There's all sorts of products like uh, Splintex and things like that that can help calm it down. You can inject around them and try and calm them down with drugs. You can use shockwave therapy. There's tons of things you can do. But the nice thing is, is that truthfully, the majority of the time, once they're cooled out, they're just a bump that you see, but it doesn't really affect the horse. I guess one negative would be is if you have a big bump and they're predisposed to winging in because they're towed out, they might hit it. And then sometimes that causes more problems, but it's kind of like the side bone. They look ugly, but a lot of times they're not a big problem. Oscillates. Um, what this is is exostosis or basically calcification or mineralization um, to the joint capsule of the ankle or fetlock joint specifically. You got to remember, especially like the ankle, it kind of has a ball around it um, or like a, a balloon that's a joint capsule. So it keeps all the fluid in this, all these joints, most joints have some sort of capsule around it to hold all the fluid in, all right? And what happens is, is where that capsule attaches, it can get really angry. And when it does that, the body starts again, tries to make it heal and then it puts bone down. Um, so have you ever seen those horses that kind of have big ankles in the front? Those are probably old, what we call old oscillates that are set. Um, Initially, if a horse gets an oscillate, um, it'll be kind of swollen in the sides or particularly in the front, um, just because there's extra joint fluid because it's angry. And if usually if joints get angry, they make extra joint fluid. So it'll be bigger than it should. Um, these horses can be lame just jogging. Uh, and for sure, they don't like it if you flex their ankle. So if you pick up their leg, like you're going to pick their foot and you kind of bend their ankle, they might not like it. You'll see them wince or kind of push away or things like that. Um, you can have chips that are involved in this, and, and a lot of times people will remove those chips. Um, but the oscillate itself, a lot of times, has to do with just the capsule and where it attaches itself. We see these a lot in racehorses, standard breds and thoroughbreds. They get them a lot just because of the nature of what they do and the strain of it, they will get these. So on the left is kind of a an intense version of it, but you get the idea, and I'm sure you've seen horses like this where they got that big pooch in the front. Um, and some of them, if they just happen again, what we call green oscillates or like new oscillates that are active, um, again, they're pretty squishy. They can be hot. And again, they really don't like it when you bend them. Um, as they get set or again, cool out, like we talked about with splints, if they cool out, um, they'll just get firm. And sometimes the horse's ankles won't bend as far, but a lot of times they don't necessarily bother them. And race horses, again, thoroughbreds and standard breds, we see these a lot. And they, they can definitely cause lameness issues and affect the horse's racing career. And you have to treat them, give them time off and things like that. The x-ray on the right kind of shows a representation of some of that mineralization. So if you look, if you look at the front of the cannon bone there, you can start to see this little extra bone starting to pop up. So that joint capsule, if you imagine, goes like this. Now it goes all the way around it, but it goes like that. So it attaches up here and it attaches down here. So this is basically the attachment point of it. And the body's reacting and making it into basically bone is what it's doing. All right, so bog spavin. Basically what this is, this is inflammation within the top joint of the hock or tarsus, what we call the tibiotarsal joint, which results in more synovial or joint fluid. So kind of like the oscillate, it gets big and squishy because there's more joint fluid. Same idea, but in the hock, all right? So they get extra fluid in it. Um, usually you notice this because kind of at the front inside of the hock, it looks like this, almost like a soft ball of fluid. Um, it's really soft. You can squish it. Um, usually it's not painful and there's usually not heat to it. Um, it can cause lameness, but that's not typical. Um, you'll usually see this in younger horses with what we have osteochondritis desiccans or what people call OCDs. Um, what OCDs are is basically it happens as they're younger 
when they're developing for, for various reasons. Um, the cartilage that lines the bone um, does not develop correctly. And basically it, it, people will call them chips, but they're not really chips. It's basically cartilage that did not form properly. And so it forms kind of away from the bone. Um, Typically, again, OCDs do not cause lameness, particularly in the hocks. And OCDs can show up in stifles, hocks, ankles, coffin joints, uh, a multitude of areas. But hocks are probably one of the most common places we see them. Um, and then they cause this swelling. Uh, again, a lot of these times, these things are caught if um, people are doing a pre-purchase exam for their horse. Um, they might not even know it's there. And we find it on x-ray. Um, um, other times, uh, particularly with standard breads and thoroughbreds, when they're younger and they're going to go to sales, they have what are called repositories, which are a whole bunch of x-rays that we have to take of like their feet, ankles, hocks, stifles, um, knees. And it's basically kind of like a, kind of like their biography of what their bones look like. So if you're going to a sale, you can look at it and look at their bones and see what the comments are or things like that to see if you like them. Sometimes we catch them on those. Um, again, there may not necessarily be any swelling or anything involved. We just catch it because of the x-rays. Um, again, I know you guys did anatomy, but just because it's been a while ago. So again, the hock actually has four joints. Um, and what one we're typically concerned about with the bog spavin is that tibiotarsal or the red arrow one that's up high. Uh, the proximal and or tarsal joint um, can get problems, but it's less uh, typical. And then the two bottom ones, the distal intertarsal and the tarsal metatarsal, they're the most common for getting arthritis, but they don't get the OCDs. The OCDs and stuff in the bog spab and has to deal with that top one. And that's kind of the biggest one that moves the most. You got to remember that's basically your ankle. So the cap of the hock is the heel of your foot. So it's kind of like they just bent their leg a little bit, but that's kind of, you walk on this whole surface here. So here's a couple of pictures of, the, of what the bog, well, the bog spavin from the outside looks like is that middle picture. So it's pretty hard to miss if they're, if they're severe enough. I mean, it's a big goose bump there. I mean, you, you can kind of see that from a mile away. But again, these horses a lot of times aren't lame. Uh, most of the time are not lame. But people call us because they go, oh, my God, I looked at my horse today and his leg's huge. You have to come and look at it. And we find OCDs. Um, the left x-ray where the arrows are pointing, those are some examples of those OCDs. Um, again, so you see, you can see how they look like chips. People will call them chips, but they're not really chips. Like it didn't fall off the bone because it got hit or something like that. They kind of developed that way. The right picture is another form of OCD. And if you look at it, where the arrow's point is kind of at the bottom of the tibia, what they call the medial malleolus, that right there in the, in the, and then the picture on your left are some of the most common areas for OCDs in the horse in general, but particularly the hock. What's kind of nice is, again, number one, they don't cause lameness, but number two, you can go in there surgically through little holes. They do arthroscopic surgery. So they put little holes in the joint and they put little tools in there and they can actually pull out those little uh, fragments. They just pull them out and then they're gone. Um, Again, they can in theory stay in there forever and not necessarily cause a problem, but some people like to take them out and hopefully it stops make them, making the joint fluid, things like that. If you left them in and someone poked a needle in that big balloon there and tried to drain it, you could drain it all, but I'm gonna bet you money it's probably gonna come back. Because again, you have these little guys in there, these little, these little pieces that are causing that to happen. So if you don't remove the little pieces that are causing it to happen, you're gonna keep having that same situation where it's gonna keep refilling and keep refilling and keep refilling. But it's a very common surgery that's done. And you can see that in, in any breed of horse. All right, so bone spavin. So the first one we just talked about was bog spavin. This is bone spavin. And what this is, is it's osteoarthritis of those lower two joints that we talked about a couple of minutes ago. Um, it's one of the most common sites of osteoarthritis in the horse. Um, if it's severe enough, um, it can lead to like this hard bony swelling that's on the inside kind of lower part of the hock. Um, if it's big enough, you can see it. Uh, if, you, if you palpate enough horse's legs, you can start to feel that it's happening. Um, if it gets bad enough, those parts can kind of start to try and fuse. Again, like we talked about with the pastor, and if the arthritis gets bad enough, the body tries to join it together and lock it off. So that can happen in the hocks too. Um, Arthritis of the tibiotarsal joint, which is the one where the bog spavin comes from, and the proximal tarsal joint, which are the two top ones, those uh, 
very uncommonly have arthritis, which is good because if those get arthritis, they're usually much more difficult to manage from my standpoint and from an owner's standpoint. They don't, they don't respond to treatments as well. So again, the bog spavin is that upper one, that tibiotarsal, that big one. And you can get those little chips or not chips. I said not to say that. I said it anyways. Um, those little fragments up there. This joint here is the proximal tarsal. So if one of these two gets arthritis, that is a little bit more difficult to deal with potentially. The distal intertarsal and the tarsal metatarsal joint, um, they get them all the time. Uh, and we can usually deal with that pretty uh, successfully. Kind of keep this picture in your head of what this looks like with these joints. And you can see what this is joint space here. Um, again, on x-ray, the harder something is, the whiter it looks. So bone's pretty hard, so it shows up white. If there is a screw in this horse's leg, it'd be bright white. Um, the less dense or hard things are, the darker they are. So way out here, this is just air. So it's black. Um, then this kind of lighter area, this is skin and muscles and tendons and ligaments because it's, kind of, it's kind of dense, but not real dense. So cartilage is not very dense. So if you take an x-ray of a joint, the cartilage really shouldn't show up. So that's why it looks like these bones are all just kind of floating on top of each other is because they're supposed to be cartilage underneath. So you want to see those black spaces on x-rays and joints. That means you have good joint space. Um, so this is kind of the, the bone spavin I talked about where you can feel and see it. So this is a horse that I work on. Um, you can see it's kind of extra bump here. Um, that is part of that bone spavin. Um, and this is this horse's x-ray. So this picture does coincide with this horse. And you can see that extra bone there. The bone shouldn't, this extra piece here and here shouldn't be there. That's it kind of trying to lock itself off and all this extra bone being formed from the arthritis. So you can look at this and see this and you can almost guarantee this horse is gonna have more bone on x-ray than it's supposed to. And when you x-ray it, it does. Along with that, the horse also has arthritis in this joint, in this middle joint um, kind of looks how it gets fuzzy. Instead of like this top one, it's a nice black line across, that joint's starting to get arthritis and it's probably trying to collapse. Uh, and this horse was a little lame. The problem is, is in hocks, as they start to collapse, the cartilage goes away. Um, that can be really painful as you can imagine. So if this was a person, you'd be getting a knee replacement, a hip replacement or something like that. We can't replace joints and horses like that. So again, what the body tries to do is fuse them. The cartilage disappears, bone goes on bone, and it's stuck together. It's like cemented together. Um, but that process is painful, it hurts. Um, the kind of nice thing, this really just applies to the hocks typically, um, is on the left where the arrow's pointing, there's supposed to be a black line all the way across there. See your right picture, how there's a nice line kind of going across there. So this horse's hock is not perfect. There's a little bit of a spur right there. So it has a little bit of arthritis in there, but it's not terrible. But you can see nice black lines all the way through. So it has good joint space. If you look at the picture on the left, there's no joint space. So basically two rows of bones have become one. The nice thing about this, again, when we talk about hocks is if the horse will fuse all the way, um, they can actually be all right. They won't be lame. Sometimes they move a little bit stiff or a little bit stabby, but they won't be lame. When that process is occurring, they can be super lame. Um, but if they get to that point on the left side of your screen, um, they, can be, they can be fine. They can still be used. So remember, bog is the upper joint and has to do more with fluid and there's not typically lameness involved. Bone spavin um, is a more significant problem and that's arthritis and that can cause lameness and other issues. <clears throat> All right, so next one we're gonna talk about is theropen. Um, what this is is inflammation within the tarsal sheath, which is kind of like a coating or a covering or a sheath that um, the deep digital flexor sits in as it goes over the hock. Um, if it gets inflamed, kind of like a joint would, it gets extra fluid in it. If it gets extra fluid in it, it starts to swell. And you'll see that kind of uh, just above the cap or point of the hock. Um, this can be caused because of stress or strain, uh, poor conformation. So a horse that's really sickle hock or it's really post-legged, so really straight up and down in the back, remember how we talked about, that puts extra stress on the, on the hock. Um, Typically, it's, it's a blemish, um, meaning it's kind of like the splint after it sets, it means you look at it and you go, ooh, but it doesn't typically cause problems. It can, depending on why it's caused, um, 
but not always. Um, it's not always associated with lameness. Um, the bigger reasons we get worried about that is if there is damage to the tendon that's inside the sheath or the sheath itself, um, that can cause a lameness. So a lot of times you just see it and you just know it's there. Sometimes it becomes an issue, then we have to try and deal with it. Um, the left side of the, of the PowerPoint shows you what that thorough pin looks like. So those kind of out pooches, they shouldn't be there. Um, and what I put on your, the left or the right side of your screen is to kind of show you where those sheets lie. And if you see that upper one is right kind of in front of the cap of the hawk, um, that's, uh, that's where they occur. Where's the kick walls? They'll get these two. They like to kick the walls out. They'll get cap talks or they'll actually get thorough pins. Um, I've had horses that um, where that tendon runs down over here, if the bone gets roughened, again, it's kind of like a, like a butter knife on a rope. And then that can make it and the horse can be lame because of that. So just because you see this doesn't mean you have to have a lameness problem. Um, but it can occasionally. So you have to pay attention to why is the horse lame? That's why you do lameness workups to see where is the pain actually coming from. But this is not typically something that causes pain. Uh, curb, uh, the fancy name for it is plantar ligament desmitis. So the, what it is is of the long plantar ligament. Um, and you can have intermittent mild or, or, or no lameness. Uh, once again, it cools out. I'm using that term cool out. We use that a lot, but once it cools out and sets, a lot of times it's not a problem. See it a lot in standard bred race horses. Uh, and again, it can kind of be associated with sickle hocked horses where their ankles kind of sit in front. Um, again, stall kickers, they'll, they'll, stall kickers like to cause problems around the hocks. Um, again, the nice thing about these is once it heals, um, the area may kind of keep its thickening or it's, it's kind of cosmetic blemish, if you will, but they're sound. Um, the way we usually diagnose these is we ultrasound them and you can actually see the ligament um, and it'll be big and inflamed and angry. Um, I don't know how well that shows up in your guys' screen, but the top right picture, you kind of see that little pooch. Uh, that's the curb. Um, and I just showed you again, because I know the anatomy was a long time ago, but the long plantar ligament is this guy right here. So it runs from like the back of the, uh, what we call the calcaneus or the cap the, or the back of the hock. And then it kind of goes down it and it starts back below the hock. Um, again, really common in, ra in standard bird racehorses, but you can see them in other horses. And again, initially they'll be painful. They'll be swollen. They'll be hot. But usually once you take care of them, the horse is fine, but they'll always keep it. They'll always kind of keep that little profile, if you will. Um, kind of a couple of ways that we deal with those. Um, restricted exercise, like this nice horse just relaxing in the bottom. Um, there's a medication called Surpass that you can use on things like this. Basically what Surpass is, it's like butte, but it's an ointment that you rub on stuff. So you can rub it on an area and it kind of gets absorbed into the body and it helps calm it down. So I always describe it as like, it's like butte that goes through the skin. That middle picture, if you guys have never seen it, is what they call freeze firing. So we have a special device that we put liquid nitrogen in. And what you do is you apply it to the area where like say this curb is um, and you make these little white dots and by freezing it, you kind of desensitize it and then you also kind of promote healing of it so it calms down. Uh, super common in standard breads. Majority of them are what you'll see in standard breads. If you ever see a standard bread and they have white dots, either um, on a splint or over where their tendons or ligaments go or on the back where the curb is, it was freeze fired. Freeze firing causes white spots to appear. There's another thing that is still somewhat done called pin firing where we use like a hot iron to do things that doesn't leave white spots. So if you see white spots like that, it got freeze fired, especially like if they're in a row. If horses get hurt, sometimes when they heal, their hair turns white. I'm sure you've all seen that on a horse. One spot's not probably freeze fired. But if you see like three, three dots and nice rows, it probably got freeze fired. Um, but you can do that to the curb. Um, again, you can do that to splints. And other tendon and ligament injuries, they, uh, that can be done. But definitely a standard bread thing, for sure. Um, so kind of going along with the soft tissue problems, we'll talk about bowed tendons. Um, what this is is an injury to the fibers of either the deep digital flexor tendon or more commonly the superficial digital flexor tendon. Um, you know, what they call the classic bow 
you can just see by looking at the horse from the side, it's kind of got that bow bow to the back of the, of the leg. And this can be on the front uh, or on the hind, but typically seen on the front. Um, and, you know, the thing about these is just because they have a bow doesn't mean there's a big hole. And just because there's not a real big bow doesn't mean there's not like say a hole in it. Um, you can't always use the size of the bow to determine how bad it's injured um, from a side of kind of how things are torn. Um, and again, this is something we usually use ultrasound to do. Same with the curb. Um, what happens is, is again, and why there's kind of variations of how this goes is you gotta remember tendons and ligaments alike are basically like a big cable, okay? Um, but inside that big cable, there's a whole bunch of little cables. So it's kind of like if you took a pack of spaghetti and put it between your hands and looked at it, that's what a tendon or a ligament looks like. So sometimes you can tear a couple of those little spaghettis. Sometimes you can tear a bunch of those spaghettis. Sometimes you just do the ones in the middle. Sometimes you do ones on the side. Um, and when we talk about bowed tendons on ultrasound, we will talk about where there is lesions or tearing. If it's directly in the middle, so there's tendon all around it. So there's a black hole in the middle, kind of like a donut. Um, we call that uh, a core lesion. And again, because it's in the core, it's in the middle, so there's still good tendon around it. Um, what happens is they don't always get real big. If they get hurt on the sides, for sure they get real big because they can expand. If it's directly in the middle of it, it doesn't really have any place to go, so they don't always get big. Um, so that's why if you're worried about things like that, we always recommend you ultrasound them so you can really see what's going on inside because you don't always get a good picture just by looking at it. <laughs> So we'll start with the left picture. So the far leg has had a bow tendon. You can see it's got that kind of big bow profile to it, right? Um, it's probably going to stand your bread. See the white dots? The white dots are freeze fires. The freeze fires on the far leg are from the, for, because of the bow. So those guys right there are because of that bow. This right here is probably either for a splint or the suspensory ligament. Um, if it was a bow, they'd probably be on the back. If they're on the sides, it's either because of the suspensory or the splint that sits right there. I forgot I had that picture. I'm glad I had that because I wanted to show you the white dots. So these are just a handful of pictures. Um, and a couple of these are left and rights. The way I ultrasound and most people in our practical trends, we do left and rights. So even if your horse has a big, huge left front tendon, I'm going to ultrasound the right front tendon. The reason is, and I do this with ligaments too, a couple. Number one, you learn in books like tendons should be certain sizes, okay? Like there's measurements and stuff. Same thing for ligaments. But a miniature pony is not going to have the same size tendons as, say, a draft horse, right? So those numbers are a little bit kind of, you can't always deal with them. So we're usually hoping that your horse only has one injured leg. And because of that, if we do both legs and we compare them, we can be comparing normal to injured. So we get an idea of what your horse should look like and what it does look like. So that's one reason we do it. The other reason is occasionally it has two problems, but you didn't know about it. Uh, particularly like in racehorses, you'll find this, you know, I'll scan one leg because it kind of looks as a bow. I go the other side and all of a sudden it's not normal either. So there's a couple of reasons why we do both legs. Um, and that's what the picture, uh, the first kind of ultrasound sitting in the middle of the screen is. If you look at it, so we're looking at the superficial digital flexor tendon, which is this guy, this guy right here. This is the deep digital flexor tendon. This is called the check ligament. And this is the, this is suspensory down here, but we're not paying attention to this stuff. We're just looking up here. Um, if you look, this tendon looks kind of, it kind of looks all the same or homogenous. If you look at this one, you can already tell it looks bigger, right? Just kind of by looking at it, but see kind of this black moat that's in the middle of it. That's actually a lesion or a tear. So this horse, it's bigger than the other one just looking at it, but also you see this black spot, which you shouldn't have it in the middle of the tendon. So that's an injury right there. This one up here, again, I actually measured this one because you can see the little green lines around it, but your normal one's actually on the right. And then if you go over to the left here, it looks bigger again, just looking at it, but see all this black in here? that's where fibers have been disrupted. So again, some of the spaghetti noodles have been injured and that's why you're getting that look to it. So again, that's why it's nice to go left and right because you can kind of look at that. Um, down here, uh, again, we're looking at the superficial digital flexor tendon. Um, 
how we use the ultrasound, we do two ways. It goes what we call cross scan and long scan. So it's like the probe's going like this way to it and then this way to it. And that's how you get these two different views. And we do those together to pair them up and they should match. So if you look at this picture up here, this tendon really doesn't look that huge, but see the black hole in the middle? It's like a jelly donut, shouldn't be there. And if you look at the long scan of it, where it kind of looks like you're looking at that pack of spaghetti, you've got, come here little mouse, come over here. I gotta get your guys' viewer out of the way. It's angry in my computer. Um, you have normal tendon here, you have normal tendon here, but then there's your jelly filling, which you shouldn't have there. So see how this kind of matches the picture next to it? We always try to do that because then you know it's real. So those are kind of different variations of a bowed tendon, kind of a, what a more typical would look like. And these are in different spots in the leg too. It can be anywhere. It can be up here. It can be down here. Some people will call those a high bow versus a low bow. Some of them, the whole thing's big, um, but you can have them in different places. Buck shins. Um, so what this is, is it's an injury to the front of the cannon bone, what we call the dorsal aspect. Um, it's very commonly seen in young racehorses, uh, especially when they first start training, or if it's a horse that's had a bunch of time off for some reason, and then it goes back to training. Um, particularly with them, when you're doing galloping, it puts a lot of stress or strain on the front of that bone. Um, and this causes inflammation of what they call the periosteum. So on the front of your bone, there is actually like a coating, which has a bunch of vessels and other things in it. And that can be angry. And if that gets angry, it gets swollen and you start to get these changes and it can be very painful. Um, a horse like this, like if you were to want to check to see if the horse is painful on its shins, uh, a couple of things you can do is you can take your fin finger and just you run it down the front of the cannibal and kind of like you're uh, scraping water off the leg. Um, if they have buck shins, you have to be careful about this because sometimes they don't like it and they lift up their legs very quickly. Another thing you can do is if you're holding the leg up, like you're going to pick the foot, you can take your fingers and push on the front of the cannon bone, kind of like you're trying to strum a drum, and you can feel these bumps. And if they're very new and angry, they can actually be soft. You can almost like push your fingers and don't think like Play-Doh, but like you just can like feel your fingers get a little bit of an indentation in them. If they're old and they have something like this, say it was really old in that picture, you could feel it, but it'd be really hard and it'd be really cold. Um, so if you feel soft spots, there you can assume that's it's more active, so it's not an old thing. But again, that doesn't initially happen right away. It's as it continually gets angry, um, it starts to get thicker and thicker, and then it becomes like basically calloused bone. Um, but that is kind of what you would look for. And they can be higher and they can be lower. Um, you can even have a couple different spots. It doesn't have to just be one area or up or low. Um, but again, most commonly seen in racehorses, standard breds and thoroughbreds, it's very common to see. It's one of the more common things you run across, again, especially when they're younger, because it's a lot of stress on their legs that they're not used to. These are a couple of x-rays of, these are two thoroughbreds. Um, if I remember correctly. So we'll start with the right picture because the left one's kind of interesting. So the right, if you can make it on your screen, those arrows are pointing to kind of those calloused areas. If you look, it's not quite as white as the bone that's right next to it. Um, that's because it's probably newer. So in this horse, you'd probably see the little bumps, but they wouldn't be huge. And you could probably kind of push your fingers into them a little bit and the horse would probably be angry. As those set, they're gonna get harder and they're gonna get, get whiter and you might be able to feel them easier, but they're gonna be hard. Um, the horse on the left is another interesting kind of phase to that, this bucking, if you will. That one, if you kind of compare the left to the right, the left doesn't have those little bumps like the other one does, but see how the whole front of this bone from here to here is way thicker than over here. So this has kind of been occurring longer and this is just, the bone keeps getting thicker and thicker and thicker kind of a step farther than just buck shins, which can be painful. Um, that is a more a concerning thing for safety and welfare is, I don't know if you can see it, but can you see that little line right there? And that little line right there, can you see those lines a little bit? They're a little bit tough to make out. Uh, this was a, a racehorse that actually now is a really nice three day eventer. Um, it got so much um, problems going on in its shin and its cannon bone, it started to develop a fracture line. 
And what we start to call these is saucer fractures, like S-A-U-C-E-R, like a saucer with a plate. And the reason is they like to do this. And sometimes they will spiral up the bone. So a worst case scenario is this starts to fracture and then someone's exercising the horse and then it breaks. The positive is if you find them before, they, before the horse really gets hurt, they heal up and they usually do fine. Sometimes they even put screws in them to kind of make them heal or sometimes they even just drill holes in the bone and just let it heal in. But if you catch them, um, they're fine. But these, this is always a scary thing, especially in race horses. This horse is, I can tell you are old because I know this horse. Um, this, is a, this is a later on x-ray that I took of it. Um, but when it was younger, uh, when the injury was newer, those were really big. So when you see those, you immediately be like, you have to stop doing anything with this horse right now. So kind of two variations of it, little new bumps, old thicker bone, but it had these lines in it. So you always pay close attention to that. All right, hoof cracks, everyone's seen them. Um, they can go horizontally, they can go vertically up and down. They can be all the way from uh, you know the horn of the hoof wall down to the ground. They can be in the heel. They can be in the quarter. They can be in the toe. Um, you know the ones we start to worry about, particularly the ones that go to the coronary band, the, those vertical ones. Um, a lot of time that's due to some sort of instability of the foot. So again, we start talking about those forces. Um, if the horses are sheer healed, um, if they're not balanced correctly, so one part of the foot is higher or lower than the other, um, they can cause this. Uh, toed out horses starts to cause problems on the inside. Toed in horses, they start to get problems on the outside because again, how much pressure they're laying down. Um, you know, foot quality has a lot to do with that too. Dry, brittle feet, they can crack easier just because they could concussion of the ground. Um, in theory, they can get them just from an injury, getting hit or something like that. Um, they can cause lameness for sure, especially like quarter cracks, um, especially if they're large enough or they are, or the stability is enough or it gets into in the tissue that's sensitive, particularly again at the coronary band, right? That's a, it's a sensitive area. Um, if they're really superficial, though, they don't usually cause problems other than kind of looking wonky. So these are just a couple of pictures of cracks. I'm sure you guys have seen. Everyone I'm sure has seen the, the first, that middle picture. It's just a little toe crack. And actually, if you really look at it, if you follow that line up, you can see it start to go up farther. But like, so that's not scary. Um, the one on the left, that horizontal crack, again, this would be one if I went and saw, I'd be doing x-rays of the feet. Is it balanced front to back, left to right? Does everything look okay? Is, it, is its heels too high or its heels too low? Why is it causing this? You know, is it towed in or towed out? And that's causing a problem because I don't know which leg that is, if it's a, uh, if it's a, if it's a left or a right. But even as ugly as those are, a lot of times the horses aren't lame. But a lot of times they're up underrun heels. Probably the more one that you're going to run that's going to cause lameness is that one that's all the way to the right. So if you look at it, number one, it goes all the way up through the coronary band, okay? And it's bleeding. So it got into the sensitive tissue and it's bleeding. So you can imagine that hurts. And I guarantee you, that guy could go there and push on either side of it and you can move the whole thing. So it's really unstable. And if it's unstable, it hurts. Um, so, you know, in trying to fix this, along with making sure the horse was balanced, what you would want to do is um, you'd want to make sure the medial lateral balance is good, the front to back is good, but you'd probably want to unload this heel here so it doesn't hit the ground as hard. And so it doesn't put as much pressure on this. And there's tons of different ways that you can, you can fix quarter cracks. Some people do what they call suturing. So they take wire on either side of the crack and they kind of tie it together to keep it stable. You can patch it with different materials. Um, but the big thing is if there's some sort of conformational problem or imbalance, you have to fix that because if you don't, it's gonna keep happening. Um, I didn't put a slide in because you can't take a picture of it, but you can see them on x-ray. They also have what are called blind quarter cracks kind of like the blind splint, you can't see it. So they will get quarter cracks inside the quarter, but it runs up the hoof wall. So you can't actually see it. And again, a lot of times those horses have some sort of conformational avenue towed in, towed out, or sometimes uh, particularly what happens is say if a horse is towed out, it's inside hoof wall will start to get more and more straight up and down. Instead of being like a cup, you know, the outside will be like this, but the inside might start to go like this. And as it gets like that, then sometimes it starts to bow in. And then it cracks user because it gets bent, bent, and bent. And sometimes they're what we call blind cracks. You can't see them all of a sudden they show. Um, but definitely quarter cracks, as you can imagine, like on the top right, that can be super painful, right? Like that's got to hurt. It's bleeding. That's not good. Uh, corns. 
Um, what this is is chronic bruising of the bars of the of the hoof uh, or the sole rather that can potentially turn into a, a foot abscess if it, if if it goes far enough. They don't have to. Um, so a lot of times it's seen in horses that are overdue for shoeing um, or the hoof has grown excessively over the shoe. So the shoe is not really protecting it anymore. That's one thing. Um, I see these all the time. I do a lot of workout in middle field with the Amish. You see these all the time in the Amish buggy horses. And sometimes it's due to because of their shoe where the boreum is placed. So these horses, this is a shoe like an Amish horse would have. So it's a regular shoe, a steel shoe. But all this material here, here, and here, uh, uh, typically it's what they call boreum. They kind of melt it on there. So what it does, it gives them grip on the ground. So when they're running down the road, they grab onto the road so they don't slip. Because of that, as you can imagine, that's, I mean, extra material. Um, it can put extra pressure on their heels and their quarters. And so that can cause them to bruise. Um, so I'll see that all the time in middle field with the Amish horses. Um, and other, again, just improper balancing. Again, one heel's higher than the other. They're towed in, they're towed out. Oh, thin soled horses, thoroughbreds that have thin soles. Thoroughbreds love to have thin soles. They can bruise easier. Um, how those can kind of turn into abscesses if they bruise bad enough, um, or even just, and this can be a chronic thing, or your horse is run out in the field and hits a rock real hard. Um, it'll bruise, then sometimes that kind of coagulates together, and then sometimes that becomes infected, and then you get an abscess. So not all corn can turn into abscess, and not all abscesses start from corns. These are a couple examples of corns. Uh, the left one, that's a pretty obvious red spot. And this is what these look like. If you start to, if your fair is trimming up the sole, instead of being nice and white, it starts to get basically reddish looking, almost like bleeding. Uh, the one on the outside of the picture is obviously less uh, severe as the inside one. Um, the lower picture, you can see it's a little bit farther back in the heel. But if you look, there's almost a little hole there. So this is probably ab abscessed. Um, then the one in the middle, I actually just took this picture yesterday. Um, I was called out because the day before the horse was super lame, like only on its toe. And they wanted me to come out. And when I got there, it was fairly sound, um, which immediately thinks you, there's an abscess. Um, and what I found when I trimmed the foot a little bit, it didn't show up as good in the picture. This arrow, there's a little bit of, a, there's reddening here, but you can't see as well. But you can see a little red there, a little red there, but see this black stuff in the bar? That actually was an abscess. And so when I cleaned it up, it used to look like this, but when I cleaned it up, it actually started to have pus come out of it. And I didn't take a picture of it, but up here on the heel bulb, an abscess had blown out of the heel bulb. It was kind of icky and smelly and stuff like that, but I opened it up from the bottom so it drains. The reason why abscess is like the blowout, like the coronary band or the heels is, uh, if you have horses that have a lot of foot or they have really hard feet or both, um, if there's an abscess brewing, abscesses are lazy. So they want to go with gravity. So they want to go down through the foot. But what happens is if they can't go down through the foot, they're like, well, if I can't go down, I might as well go up. And that's why they blow out the top. So this horse is, was probably getting worse and worse and worse. And then the abscess blew out of the top. If you look, even like the hairline looks a little bit icky looking compared to their side, that's because the abscess blew out. So um, corns can lead to abscesses, but they don't have to. Um, if, if horses have corns, um, and they don't have shoes. I'll tell people just to put shoes on. It's real simple and see how it does or try to toughen up their feet. Um, if they have shoes on, you try to do pads or again, you start X-raying. Is there some sort of conformational abnormality overall that's having issues with it? Or is maybe the horse a little bit low on one side versus the other? Is it too low in its heels? Um, is it thin sold that just needs more protection? I think this is the last disease we have. So this has to do with the suspensor ligament. Um, if you guys remember from your lecture with anatomy, there's kind of two parts, if you will, the suspensor at least that we are concerned with. So there's that main body part, and then there's those branches that connect to the top of the sesamoids, and then from there it wraps around to the front of the foot. The wrapping around to the front of the foot part, we don't worry about as much. Um, but that main body part, kind of behind the cannon bone, and then those parts that break, break off onto the sesamoids are always super important to us. Um, so this is a, a common injury in athletic horses of all disciplines, race horses, quarter horses, um, warm bloods, it goes across the board. Um, anything that's getting overstressed or stressed, it can happen to, it doesn't matter what your discipline, rainers, race horses, doesn't matter. Um, it just can be like an acute issue. So in the race, the horse comes up real lame. 
Um, it can be kind of a long-term smoldering chronic issue too. It can be both. The horse can have problems low grade going on and it has a really bad step or something. Um, for sure, uh, if the horse has like a long sloping pastern or again, my number one pet peeve confirmation straight hocked behind, you definitely put a lot more stress on those suspensories um, and that can kind of predispose them to injury. Uh, a lot of times we classify them by location. So what we call a high or proximal suspensory injury, a mid body, or again, the branches. Some people just say it's either main body or branches. Um, depending on the severity and the, uh, the location of it, the, the treatment and uh, the healing time vary. It just depends on how bad it is and where it is. And if there's other things uh, associated with like bone problems, and I'll show you a couple x-ray or ultrasounds. Um, probably most commonly, this is diagnosed with ultrasound. It's nice because you can do it in at the farm it's, it, and it's straightforward. Um, but you can also do an MRI, kind of like we did on the feet. You can do that on the suspensory in certain in, in areas, um, and they can show up things. There's sometimes we can't catch as well on ultrasound, and the MRI works. But the nice thing about ultrasound is it's way cheaper. Uh, we can do it right there on the farm. Um, so kind of that left picture is just to kind of give you kind of how some people break it down. So the proximal is that first part. And what, remember, that suspensor kind of starts up back behind the knee goes about two thirds of the way down the cannon bone and then branches off to the sesamoids. And that's the same for the front or the back. Um, so the arrows, yes, the arrows coincide with the parts of it. So if you look at the bottom picture that goes with the proximal suspensory. Um, and what that is, is kind of, this part here is the back sloping of the cannon bone. So you have to think about if you kind of turn your head this way, the right is the top and the left is bottom going down the back of the camel. It's funny watching everybody do what I just did. Hope I didn't look that silly. Um, but no, ultrasounds are weird because it's these are way harder to read than x-rays. This is a whole different thing. But so that's your suspensor and it's way bigger than it should be. So the circle here is kind of showing there's a lesion right there, but this overall size is bigger. Remember how we talked about the spaghetti? So this, uh, these are tendons and other ligaments up here. Um, you should have nice long fibers. You know, when you go get spaghetti, right, from Olive Garden, you don't want tiny little pieces of spaghetti. You want nice long noodles, right? Same thing with tendons and ligaments. You want nice long noodles. So if you look up here, this isn't the suspensor, but you can kind of see nice long little noodles in there, 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 stuff like that. You see how this one, your noodles are look like they're really chopped up, like the chef is really mad at you. That is a sign that there's an injury. And overall, this thing's way bigger. Um, the reason that's important to look at the back of the cannon bone where it starts to kind of attach and start from is um, that the injury, certain injuries, they can actually pull a piece of the bone off or what we call a voles, a piece of bone. So actually think of it like a screw eye in the wall and then there's a string to it and you pull on the string real hard and it pulls kind of some of the wood off. That's what it can do to the bone. It can actually pull part of the bone away. So suspensory ligament issues can involve the bone too. So that's one spot. Um, your upper right picture is more of like a mid body. And again, these are left and rights. So left leg, right leg. Left leg is overall pretty normal looking. It's size, it all kind of looks the same. Um, but if you notice on the right side, again, we kind of got that, we got that donut hole. We got that, um, we got the jelly donut hole in there. So that little guy shouldn't be there. Overall, this thing looks a little bit bigger, but you got a hole, shouldn't have a hole. It should all be kind of, again, that homogenous, just all look the same. Um, this last blower right picture is of the branch, kind of how it attaches to the bone. So again, um, this is actually on the same leg. So this is the outside branch. This is the inside branch. So this one's injured. So if you look at the good one first, this is bone right here. So it's nice and smooth and it's all continuous. You know it's bone because ultrasound is like sonar, okay? So it goes through stuff and it get bounces back depending on how dense tissue is. Bone's super hard. So what happens is um, it hits it and it comes back, but it can't go through it. So you don't know what's behind here because it's bone. Um, but you have all these nice fibers coming off it and it's one continuous bone. You see how the bone on this side looks like it kind of got chopped up by a, by a, hack, a hatchet. So number one, this ligament's injured. Look how much bigger this is than over here. There's all these kind of dark spots in it and see these little gaps. It probably pulled pieces of bone 
off the sesamoid. That's, that's not an uncommon thing to see with horses that hurt the branches of the suspensory. They will pop a piece of the sesamoid off of it. So again, although we're talking about a ligament injury, a soft tissue injury, you can have bone problems too. So it's important to look at this stuff. And a lot of times I will x-ray a hock and x-ray an ankle to make sure there are no other bone issues. But you can sometimes get an idea just from the ultrasound. Like I can tell you on x-ray, this wouldn't look good. Um, but this is that suspensory coming into the bone. So again, if you looked at this picture and you tilted your head to the left, this is kind of the ligament coming down and attaching to the bone. Does that make sense? So it's attaching there. Mm -mm -mm. Um, you know, just kind of talking about treatments because I'm ever sure some everyone's had a tendon or a ligament issue or know some friend. The biggest thing always is rest. They need time to recuperate. Uh, then they need what you know an exercise plan of how to begin exercising because you want to start slow. You know, usually it's like hand walking, then ride walking, and then trotting in straight lines, and then trotting more days in straight lines, and then maybe trotting all the way around the ring, and then maybe cantering on the long sides and then maybe cantering the whole ring. The reason we do that is we slowly increase the stress. Um, because just like if you sprain your ankle, you're not gonna go out and run the next day, right? You gotta put your foot up, then you're walking a little while, then you try and run a little bit, then you're kind of going back to it. Same thing with horses. Uh, it takes time to do those things. Um, and I think that is it. So if you guys have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. I've never had a horse do this to me, but that would be scary because he'd probably fall on me. Actually, my favorite part is the cat in the corner with the question mark because he's not sure what's going on. Because cats love it when the vets come for the horses because they know they're not going to mess with the cats. We don't do small animal. We just do cats or do the horses. So cats and dogs love us on farms. So I think that's it. So you guys got questions? Um, you just mentioned the um, blind splints a little bit. I was just wondering, um, like, are there additional things that are done when a horse has blind splints? Like, is that something that? Yeah, yeah. So how you treat them can be different. So time is one thing. Uh, time, uh, cold therapy, uh, medications to calm it down. I don't really have a picture of that, of what I want. I don't know how to... Okay, yeah, I do. Ha, huh, got it. Okay, so... On a blind splint, if you're gonna x-ray it, you could actually see it forming in here. So kind of like uh, we had the splint pop out here, it can pop out in here. Um, sometimes you can inject it with stuff to calm it down. Um, if it's real bad, in, in theory, they can do surgery and try to remove it. But again, you don't wanna do that because they're overlapping, but this is a splint bone, this is a splint bone, and then this is the cannon bone here, all this, it's kind of like overlapping, but right behind this cannon bone is that suspensory and then there's nerves. Um, so you, you do basically treat them the same, but you can run the more problems with the blind splints um, and they can be a little bit more difficult to deal with because they start involving other structures and not just the splint bone. Um, but more, most splints you see, they go out, they don't go in, luckily. But good question, that's a very good question. Anybody else? No questions, you guys are vets now. What do the sesamoid bones do? Well, so number one, do you remember that there's more than one sesamoid in the horse? Remember that from your anatomy lesson? So that navicular bone we talked about in the beginning, that's actually technically a sesamoid, but I'm assuming you're talking about the ankle ones, right? Yeah. Okay, cool, I just wanna make sure. So, they, they partly make up the, the ankle joint. The ankle joint is made up of the cannon bone. You guys can see my mouse when I move it, right? Okay, good, because I would feel like a real idiot if I was doing that for the last hour and you couldn't see it. Wow, that would have been awkward. All right, anyways, back on point. So cannon bone, first pastern bone. There's two sesamoids here, but they're paired, so they're kind of summating with each other. Um, the biggest thing to think is that, where's my other picture? That was a better picture of the sesamoids though. This is a good picture though. I forgot I had this picture. Okay, so here's your suspensory. So the kind of remember I talked about for your blind spin coming real quick, it kind of hides behind the splint. So it comes down, 
the big thing is it attaches to these sesamoids. It's all part that makes up this joint, and it kind of also helps sling this together. As you can see, it kind of comes down. It's suspensory. It suspends. Um, it attaches to these sesamoids, again, paired, and it comes around to the front. Um, but as you can imagine, if horses, like a racehorse is running real hard, um, it puts a lot of stress on those. So they'll, they hurt their suspensories. If you go and Google a picture of a racehorse running after this talk or right now, certain pictures will show you one leg on the ground. And that one leg, the ankle is almost sitting in the sand. So the ankle goes from up here all the way to down here. Um, and that's why they hurt them. That's a lot of stress. And that's why they pull pieces of bone off. So the sesamoids partly pay uh, uh, an aspect of making up this joint, but it's also an area of connection for these suspensors. Because remember, what do ligaments do? Ligaments go from what? Bone to bone, right? So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a segue before it gets to the front. But it's a very important ligament in the horse, especially the lower limb. It has a lot to do with with how particularly the ankle joint sits and moves and, and things like that. It's kind of the short and narrow of it. Remember they're paired, you got two on each leg, so you got eight of them. We have a question. All right, shoot. You briefly mentioned a straight hop conformation. We were wondering if you could elaborate on that. Okay. Oh, I don't think I have a picture. So um, in the confirmation talk, we talked about uh, one of the, and this was my pet peeve thing. Uh, my biggest like pet peeve for of confirmation abnormality is so if you square a horse up appropriately, you should be able to draw a line from their back of their butt to the back of their hop to the back of their ankle all in one line. So just to recap, sickle hock, the ankle kind of goes too far forward. So it kind of comes down and, and, and it spheres forward towards the front of the horse. Post-legged horses are abnormally upright. So the angle of their hock and their stiple is too straight. So it literally looks like their leg is a post. Um, and there's research that's been done on like what the angle it should be. And if it goes over a certain angle, what happens is it puts too much stress on literally the whole hind leg. Um, the stifle, the hock, the ankle, and particularly the suspensory ligament. And there is some research that shows that if it's over a certain degree, it puts X amount of pressure extra on the suspensory and you are more likely to injure it. So the post-legged confirmation or straight up confirmation is you have too big of, so instead of being like this, maybe it's like this behind. So their butt, their hock, and their ankle will still line up but the hock angle is way bigger than it should be. And that puts a bunch of stress on the whole rest of the leg. That's the post-legged confirmation. They call it post-legged because it, if they're severe enough, like the whole leg looks like a post basically. So there's no like going up to the, like this one, there's no going up to the hock and then going forward. The hock, the tibia here is farther back. And this, this angle is bigger. And that's a, that can cause a lot of problems on multiple structures, but that's what post-legged is which it will be, it's in that confirmation talk too, if you go, I have good pictures of it. You can Google a picture too, probably faster. You can pull up my YouTube thing. And can having the post like leg that affects like movements or activities? Yeah, it can. So they can, they can move differently um, because of their confirmation. Sometimes they can move their leg forward without bending as much. So there is sometimes a little bit of a subtle change in the movement potentially. But again, the bigger thing about the post leg it is, um, how it changes the dynamics and the physiology of the rest of the leg and how it moves and the stresses that are on certain things more than there should be. You know, the bodies, and again, no, again, we've talked about in the confirmation talk, very few horses are truly perfect confirmationally. Um, but particularly with like the post leg, that puts a lot of stress on the rest of the, basically the whole hind leg. Um, and that isn't necessarily an issue for how it moves, but it's an issue of the stresses, it undue stresses it puts on ob ob most of the structures of the leg, especially the suspensory. Those legs that are post-legged, the horses that are post-legged, you may see that their ankle looks like it drops more than it should in the back or in the front, or not the front, sorry, that's a different thing. Uh, in the back, they're post-legged, their ankle kind of sinks a little bit more. Instead of being more upright, it maybe kind of sinks a little bit. And that's because of the pressure going straight down the leg. but it should look like a post, hence the term post-legged.
Who else? I know there's got to be more questions. This one isn't specific to lameness, but what's the difference between laminitis and founder? <laughs> A three hour conversation. Um, it, there's a lot to it and probably most vets and most farriers we kind of interchange them so laminitis if you just use the term laminitis itself it's inflammation of the lamina i don't have a foot picture around this thing yeah i do huh hold on a second hold on a second kids where's the x-ray of the foot where's where's our our, our arthritis in the past dun, 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 dun. okay haha all right, so looking at the right picture, ignoring all the other stuff. So we're just pretending that this is just a normal foot x-ray. Uh, and that nail was probably put on the front of the foot so you can see the front of this. So <clears throat> coffin bone, this guy right here. Here's your dorsal hoof wall or front of the hoof wall. You probably can't make it out super well, but if you look, there's a line right there that kind of goes up it. And this area here is a little bit blacker and this area here is a little bit whiter, okay? Can everyone kind of see that or imagine what I'm trying to say? Okay, cool. So how the foot works is there is lamina that comes off of the hoof wall and there's lamina that comes off the bone. So basically like these, like you ever seen an air filter in a car? Does that kind of make sense? Like a bunch of little fins together or blinds that are open. Think of blinds that are open. So a bunch of just little shelves, right? So you have these coming from both surfaces and what they do is they kind of lock together, all right? And that's how the hoof holds on to the bone is all these little laminae. In laminitis, if you, use, if you say just laminitis itself, inflammation of the lamina, that darker area, which is the sensitive lamina, can get thicker and wider and angry. Um, if your farrier ever says he, he nailed the horse too close or hot nailed the horse, or someone says that to you, it means they accidentally got into, I'm using my finger to point at the screen when you're not in front of me, um, the black area here, which is sensitive. Your farrier nails into this white here. That's not sensitive. Because remember, that's your fingernail. That's a real thick fingernail. So they nail into that. So this black area is more sensitive. So laminitis can be just the overall thickening of this. So we do certain measurements to see the overall thickness of this. If it's a, over a certain percentage, you can say there's laminitis. It's thicker than it should be just numerically. So it's a number. And I usually sometimes explain as like laminitis is kind of that initial process and, and founder, if you will, is kind of the leftover or it's kind of like the what's left after the storm goes through to some degree. Um, you know, so if you take x-rays, the horses, this may be way thicker than it should be. Um, the hoof wall may go out this way and the bones back here. So they talk about the horse rotated it's kind of like the bone and the outer part of the hoof wall are kind of separating away from each other. And that's because that lamina that's holding it together is breaking down for some reason, whether it ate too much grain, um, it, it got sick from something, it got poisoned. Um, there's a metabolic problem like Cushing's disease. It causes those, the binding of it to let go. And because of it, it separates away. So one thing they do is they, what they call rotate. So it kind of starts to rotate away from itself. That's if basically just the front part gets injured. If it gets injured all the way around, because remember the hoof goes all the way around the foot, right? Except for the back. If all the way around it gets injured, those horses can sink. Those are what they call sinkers. So basically what happens is Enough of those, those kind of those bind, those uh, bonds are broken. It can't hold itself and it starts to slowly start. It's a sheer force. So it starts to push down. Because remember, if you weigh a, a thousand pounds and things aren't holding on tight, you're going to go through them, right? Kind of like if you start to step on the snow, you're going to go right through the snow. You step on concrete, you're going to stay hold. So laminitis is kind of like that initial stage. And founder, a lot of times, some people will say it's kind of the what you're left with afterwards. There's a lot of debate on that. Like I said, that could be like a three hour topic, um, but it, they're used interchangeably a lot too. And you know, like sometimes people say that initial, when the horse is going through it, it's laminitis. And then kind of what's left is the founder stage. And they can have that once and never have it again. There are some horses that will repetitively get it for certain reasons. Um, like I said, we could do a whole pony club conversation on just founder and laminitis. Um, because, because it's a, 
it's a big thing. I mean, everyone's had a horse that's foundered or a friend's horse that's foundered or things like that. There's a lot of reasons they can do it, but that's a good question. But there's a lot to it and a lot of different theories of what technically what each term means. So like, if like, I, I wouldn't have a big argument with like a client that's like, oh, my horse isn't foundering its limb. And I could be like, okay, that's fine. Still doing that. You're still trying to address the same problems. So, but good question. If you don't have questions that pertain directly to this, you can ask them. That's fine. Because that is another big one you probably have heard of or seen. Anybody else? No one's got any other questions. That's Shoot. not random, but what is that like tack looking thing on the bottom of the fight? Uh, it's exactly what you said it was. So that was very good. Um, this is actually not my x-ray. I had a hard time trying to find a horse that had low ring bone. So I, I, I stole this x-ray. I borrowed it. Stealing is not a good word. I didn't steal it. I borrowed it. Um, so just like the nails trying to mark the outer hoof wall, uh, which some people do, the tack is probably the tip of the frog or the apex of the frog. Um, way far past this talk but you can look at like the balance of the foot where the breakover of the foot is where the center of grass there's there's a lot of things you can do especially when it comes to shoeing the horse and so people like to use markers so this is a marker for the apex of the frog so the frog probably goes from all the way back here which you can kind of see it kind of pop out there and then it goes to here so this person was marking the tip of the frog which is usually on x-ray farther back than the tip of the coffin bone. Um, but it's usually, to, it's usually to mark the tip of the frog. Not everyone does that. That's kind of a individual thing, but good question. Or maybe the horse stepped on the tack and they didn't know, it, but I'm guessing they probably put it there on purpose. But that's a good question. Thought someone else had a question. I thought they were gonna talk at the same time and politely decline. Nothing else? Go ahead, Madison. Shoot. Okay. So I was looking at pictures of the system. No, you can't see it because it's clear. But is no. that like the sinking portion of it? Yeah. Yeah. So can everyone see her picture? No, no. Can everyone see the picture of her picture on the picture? <laughs> that horse probably blew something out because it looks like there's a device on the front of it, like a splint. But yeah, that's ankle sink. When we talk about ankle sink, it's literally how the ankle starts to sink. I don't know if that horse has ankle sink because of confirmation. Uh, if, again, if they injure that tendon enough or, or ligament, sorry, because we were talking about suspensory. If they, if they, but it can happen with both. If they injure that a tendon or a ligament enough, especially like the superficial or the suspensory that really holds everything, because, hold on a second. Where'd you go, little guy? A lot more pictures than that. Come on. So, if you watch this deep digital flexor tendon, that's the blue, the yellow one. It goes light yellow. Or wait, sorry, the light yellow one goes down and attaches the back of the P2. The deep digital flexor tendon goes all the way down into the foot, and that suspensory grabs the ankle and goes forward. So, if you severely injure any one of these, or multiple together what happens is you got to remember this is all holding the back of that ankle right like that ankle is kind of leaning back on it if you severely injure one of these you lose that this 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 apparatus this holding apparatus and so what happens is this ankle sinks so if you tear your superficial real bad uh, the ankle can drop if you tear your suspensory real bad your ankle can drop or if over time so again Injuries can be either like acute or happen right then and there, or they can be a slow progressive things. They can start to break down, break down, break down, and that ankle slowly starts to sink, 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 sink. So that's that's the sinking, is th those a tendon or a ligament or both get so injured either right away or over time that it just can't hold it and it kind of breaks down more and more and more. That's kind of what that is. But again, that post-legged conformation also doesn't usually help that. 
typically doesn't help that. A lot of times those horses like to sink a little bit in their ankles anyways. But the picture you showed me, there was something on the front of the foot it looked like. I don't know if that was like a splint to try and help hold it up or what that was, but that horse could have acutely injured itself, so. They have an after picture as well. I wonder what, what was the after picture? Uh, hold on, let's see if I can show it. So it looks much better. So I'm not sure, what, it's like the, yeah. So is there something extending behind the shoe? I'm assuming that's what it is. Okay. So, so when you hurt these tendons or ligaments and this ankle drops, and this is why we talk about angles, we want to have good angles, right? Um, one of the first things we do when it comes to shoeing a horse with tendon or ligament issues um, is you want to put a shoe that, so if say your normal shoe stops here, you want the shoe to go back farther because what that does is it adds support farther back to help support whatever whatever structure you may have injured. And whether it's a tendon or a ligament, we always have you put a bigger shoe on. So we either do what we call an egg bar shoe, which looks like a whole egg, it's all one piece, or we will do uh, one with trailer. So it's like a regular shoe, but then the ends of it, the heels extend farther back. That helps support everything. Um, that was a rather significant improvement from just a shoe, I feel like in my opinion, but it does help. And you have to help support those structures. So shoeing of ligament and tendon issues is very important because you have to help support what's injured. You want to make sure it doesn't get hurt more because of an improper angle. So that's probably what that picture is trying to show you, I'm guessing. For the, I don't know if you said tearing or like hurting the ligaments, is it, or tendons, is it more common in the front or back or is it like not a difference? It, a little bit of it depends on what the animal's doing for sure. Um, so I don't think I could just throw out a specific one because um, like in racehorses, you can see it in the front of the back, um, usually in the front though, say a thoroughbred, usually in the front, uh, standard breads can get it in the front of the back. Um, you know, if you start to look at different disciplines, see what end is getting more pressure on it. So um, like if you guys have ever seen rainer horses go, think about those circles, the stops they have to make, the circles. Um, that puts so they're putting that whole horse and the rider kind of on the back end, right? So it would not be uncommon to see issues in, in the hind end there because um, they use their Western performance horses usually use their hind end pretty hard. But that's not to say they can't hurt the front end. Uh, I have reigning clients that have horses that hurt the front end. Um, so it, it depends on the breed and the discipline of what they're doing. Um, so I guess I couldn't give like a percentage or something. That's a good question though. Um, but again, a lot, a lot of it depends on the discipline of the horse and what it's doing. Is there a common one with like jumping? Um, I don't know of a stat off the top of my head of front versus back, but they can definitely do both and tendons and ligaments. Um, a lot of times the superficial or the suspensories they can injure for sure. Um, but I, don't, I can't think of a stat off the top of my head. Because again, you think about it, they push off, they use a lot of strength, right? But then they're also landing with a lot of pressure. You know, say you're doing Grand Prix, like you're not doing cross pulls and you got a thousand pound horse plus a rider. Um, that's a lot of weight landing and taking off. So they can, they can hurt either. You know, you got to look at both sides of what's going on. Um, I... Don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, but I think I remember listening to some lecture and they were talking about um, osteogenesis and when they were talking about ossification, is that like? So, okay, mm -hmm. sorry, finish what you're gonna say. I, I was just asking like if those were the same or if it was a different. Osteogenesis is just like the basically the formation of bone. Um, that's all it means in simple layman terms. It's, it's production of bone, um, but there's different words that kind of mean the same. So um, when I was talking about the oscillates, I said exostosis. So that's just a formation of bone. Um, so that's kind of just a variation of a very fancy medical term of seeing formation of bone. Um, like the disease osteogenesis imperfected. You guys know what that is? You ever heard of that disease? It's a, it's a, it's a human disease where you mostly see it. 
Uh, so osteogenesis, so bone formation imperfecta, you know, not perfect. Um, those people have very brittle bones and depending on the severity of the disease, they can break super easily. Um, what was the movie? There's a movie that someone had it, had Samuel L. Jackson and Bruce Willis in it. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but that gentleman had osteogenesis imperfecta, so his bones did not form properly and they weren't as strong as normal. So say you could fall down on your arm and you're okay. That person could fall down and they could break every bone in their arm because their bones just aren't made perfectly. Um, but that osteogenesis is just the formation or production of bone is a, for, is a way of saying that. It's a foo-foo word, makes you sound smart, right? What else we got? Uh, what are wind puffs? Ah, uh, wind puffs. See, there's, there, we could like do like 10 more pony club things. So uh, it's a little bit like the Theropen. Uh, and what it is, is it, it, it is extra fluid or, or synovial fluid or effusion. Effusion just means excess fluid um, of the sheaths by the ankle. Bum, 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 bum. Aha, look at that. Look at this. I know I put this picture in for a reason. So we said the theropen was up here, right? Tarsal sheet. Mm -hmm. These are digital sheaths. So um, wind puffs are extra fluid in that tendon sheath right there. So it's not in the ankle because that's right here. It's behind the suspensory, not in front of it. If it's in front of the suspensory, it's usually the ankle joint itself. Um, the digital sheath, which is right there, which again is again one of those like little sheaths that the tendon runs through to protect it. Um, that gets extra fluid in it. And they can actually get them in the bottom here too. So see that little pink guy right there? That can get extra fluid too. That one's kind of easy to feel along with the wind puffs because if you go and feel the back of their pastern while they're standing, it feels like a bubble. So if they have that, that's a little bit of extra. So, but, but wind puffs is, is basically the version of Theropin above the ankle is what it is. But that's a good question. And same thing like Theropin, they don't have to have a lameness issue. Again, a lot of horses, especially hunter jumpers, three-day eventers, dressage, they will get that. And it's, it doesn't mean something's wrong or bad or horrible. But that's a good question. I'm glad I had that picture on there. That worked out way better than me trying to explain that. What um, else? I had another. We covered confirmation that causes most of these. But what's confirmation that causes oscillates and hoof cracks? So oscillates for sure. Again, you see this a lot in the thoroughbreds and stuff. Um, long sloping pat, uh, sl long sloping pasterns. So they got them long pasterns that sit a little bit lower, because then you got to remember something, 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 something. Picture, picture, picture. Um, if this ankle sits lower. As this, oh, that's not what I want. Hold on. I don't know. I just wouldn't go to the oscillate thing. That was really smart of me. Hold on. Ho, 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 ho. Okay. So oscillate. If this pastern is long or real sloped, you got to imagine as this horse walks, this closes, right? This is the front of it. This is the back of it. So this drops to the ground. This closes. So if it's a longer sloping pastern, this may close harder, if you will. And so you stretch this joint capsule more. So that would be one thing I'd see it in a long sloping pastern. Um, that would be a confirmation I'd probably see it in. Maybe a horse with low heels, because again, you're making things lower than they should be. Um, as far as the hoof cracks and stuff, again, this isn't always, but like towed out horses, a lot of times their inside hoof walls like to be straighter. So they put more pressure on those, plus there's more weight coming down through it towed in horses, you can get cracks on the outside. Not just because a horse is towed out, doesn't mean you have to have cracks on the inside. You can get them on the outside. Um, so where the pressures go, again, if you took a picture and the foot was like real higher on one side than the other, you're gonna be really beating up that lower side. So you can get it there too. So a lot of hoof cracks, cracks come from imbalance issues in the foot. That's definitely a big spot that you see it. That's why you, it's nice to take a couple of x-rays and see where you're at. And your farrier may say that if you have a crack or something, they may say, let's get x-rays to see the angles. That's why, to make sure everything's balanced correctly. Um, going back to the wind puffs, I think it was. Um, yep. 
Just be drained. Yep. You can. And then they'll probably come back. <laughs> they can. And same with the thorough pen. So you can drain them, but a lot of times they come back. So again, they kind of, most of the time, most of the time, they can be associated with lameness or something else going on. Um, but because they're not causing a problem, I just kind of tell people just don't look at it because if you try to drain it, most of the time it comes back and sometimes it comes back with more fluid. So you just know they're there. And if there's a lameness issue, then we see if it's coming from that and we go from there and we treat it if we need to. Otherwise, you don't, in my opinion, you don't really mess with them because they're, they're probably going to come back. Kind of like with the bog spab and with the OCDs and the hawk. If you have that and you drain it, more than likely it's going to come back. So it's one of those blemishes that doesn't typically get associated with lameness. So I just tell people, leave it be. I'm kind of one of those, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's a perfect example of that. But good question. Um, is like inflammation of the elbow common? Like this? anything cause that? Uh, so, uh, infrequently. Um, problems in the elbow and problems in the shoulder are truthfully not that common. That's, that's just a fact. Um, they can get fractures. They can get OCDs. They can get arthritis. They can. Um, but it's very infrequent, which is good because a lot of times when they have it, it's very difficult to deal with. Um, majority of the issues in the horse are from the hock and the knees down. Of that, a significant portion is from the ankle down. I mean, that's just a fact. Um, but they can get it for sure. They can get arthritis. I've had very few and they're hard to deal with. It's such a high motion thing. They also move a different way. If you have a shoulder or an elbow that doesn't, that is not healthy, they have a weird way of moving. Um, you got to imagine if your shoulder hurts, the last thing you want to do is bring your shoulder, your arm over your head, right? Because your shoulder hurts. You don't want to do that. So you got to imagine if you're a horse, bringing your, the horse's leg forward is like you bringing your arm over your head, right? You're just kind of down on all fours. So if your arm hurts, they get a weird way of moving or if their elbow hurts or their shoulder hurts. So they do get problems, but it's pretty infrequent. They can get sore shoulders and stuff. Um, but that's usually a compensation thing. So like, I'll get that, like, you'll see that on like lameness as we see, you know, the, the, you know, someone came out and looked at my horse and they thought the shoulder was sore. So we worked on the shoulder and it got better for a week, but then it got worse again. It's because probably that's not your real problem. It's someplace else lower. Cause that's usually when they happen. I mean, that's just a fact. The lameness is probably coming from lower, but what happens is because the horse isn't moving correctly, it's shoulder hurts. And you make the shoulder feel better, but you didn't fix the real problem, which means the shoulder starts to hurt again. Um, you fix the problem, usually the shoulder does better. Uh, if you're gonna bet money, it's usually not the shoulder or the elbow. I'll be honest with you. I'll bet you money and I'll probably win majority of the time. Um, but they can get problems for sure, especially traumas like fractures, getting kicked, things like that. I've had a couple arthritis and I've had some OCDs that, that, that form there. So they can happen, but far less common. I assure you, they're far less common. And again, that's good because there are joints that don't always respond well to treatment. So they're harder to maintain and treat and things like that. A lot of the shoulder stuff is like OCDs. So kind of like the hawks, things that they're born with or developed with early or trauma. They get kicked, they fall, run into things, stuff like that. And we have to deal with those. And again, it's hard to do in a horse because if you hurt your shoulder, they put you in a sling and tell you not to use your arm for a while. You can't do that with a horse. So uh, certain injuries can be very difficult to deal with, even surgically. So, but good question. It can happen, but not nearly as common as things lower on the leg. This goes back to something like a while ago, but for the abscess, you said like yep. blow out the heel. Does it like, is it the pressure that like makes a hole in the heel? No, it probably blew out. So it kind of eroded away the tissue. And if an abscess, 
and if the abscess sits there long enough and festers and doesn't go one way or the other, it can't get out, it'll almost undermine underneath the sole. So you'll open up a hole and there'll be like a false floor or, or like a basement. You have to remove all that. The nice thing is, is they usually, most horses can grow foot back real well. So even if you have to open that hole to let it drain and treat it and expose it, a new sole will grow in and that'll kind of grow out and then you'll be fine. Um, but it's, it's, it's from the erosion process of the disease. And again, not all corns and bruises have to turn into abscesses, but they can. Or the vet opens them like I did that one. I opened the bottom. So, because if they don't drain, they, that's why they're lame. They, there's, it's too much pressure. They can't get out, it can't get out. And so if you open it, all instantly those horses are much sounder like infinitely sounder. They may not be perfect when I leave, but they're way sounder and then it takes a couple of days and they do all right. But you have to get it to drain. If you don't let it drain, they stay super lame. Usually how the abscess works is, my horse was kind of lame a few days ago. Uh oh, it's getting lamer. Oh my God, I have to call the vet tonight because the horse won't put its foot down only stands on its toe. And about that time, the abscess is getting ready to blow because the worse it gets, the worse the horse gets. I have all that time they it's oh my god my horse was horrible last night you have to come out today and i get there and the horse is sound they're like well i don't get it what happened half the time it blew out and they didn't see it like that one picture i showed you the day before i went out the horse was crippled they said on its toe wouldn't walk i got there and it was basically sound but the abscess blew out as soon as the pressure is off they're happy so you just got to relieve the pressure whether it comes out the bottom or the top or both but you got to get the pressure out that's the key got to open it once an abscess goes out, are they for the most part sound? You mean initially or long term? Long term. Yeah, they're fine. Yeah, usually abscesses don't cause a problem. Uh, some horses are more predisposed against thin soled horses, stuff like that. Um, so you have to kind of take measures to stop them from getting abscesses. Again, first steps a lot of times putting a shoe on or a pad or helping them grow more foot or making their foot harder if they don't grow a lot of sole. There's products that can harden the sole. Um, but long term, no, usually they're not a big deal. Very infrequently. And that's usually if the abscess does something it shouldn't like go to a place it shouldn't. It gets to infect the bone or this or that, but that's super uncommon. More than likely they'll be all right. And then the red dots that you're pointing out on the sole or like red parts, that does that like um, come with an abscess or like have anything to do with it? No, uh, not so that's just literally bruising of that foot. Where were corns? Were corns before or after? After. So that's literally bruising. So you smash your finger in the door. What color does your finger turn? Red, right? Well, maybe purple too, but so it's that it's a repetitive pressure that getting hit, it causes it to bruise. So it's bruising or those little what we call petechiations or red dots. That's bruising. Um that's all bruising. So that's been beating that area up enough where it starts to bleed. So it's almost like bleeding. It's little tiny blood spots. But those can eventually turn into abscesses. Again, they don't have to. You can have just corns. But like that one, that probably turned into an abscess and that's why that hole is there. This horse, I cut some of the bruising away, but that was an abscess that actually led all the way up there. And it blew out here. And then once I paired this away with my hoof knife it started to ooze pus there too so that bruising is that kind of you know as we said up here gosh I wish this window wasn't always in the way it's just it's either a chronic bruising but it can be a pretty pretty acute one you know your horse runs out in the field hits a rock and then uh oh it's lame but it's that sole getting injured the sole of the foot getting injured which is a lot of times back here in the heel or in the bar, this is what we call the bar right here. You guys remember that from your talk? Um, they can get them in here too. It's pretty common place. Heels, bar, abscess is always around the perimeter. So the heel, the bar, the toe, and around here. They don't usually happen like all of a sudden in the middle. It's usually always around the edges. And a lot of times right at the toe or back here in the heels. That's the most common places you're gonna find them. How often do corns turn into abscesses? Mm. Um, it's hard to say because you don't always find the corns you just find the abscess but I wouldn't say all the time like if you find a corn you shouldn't go oh my god mom it's going to be an abscess I knew it it's going to happen call somebody it's not like that 
but it can be a cause of it. Anybody else? All right, let's hear it. Okay. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about how the horse's shoulder hurt and it's always further down, for, an, for it not to hurt, when you're trying to figure out what's going on lower down, is there a way to like support the thing, like, like the shade of the shoulder? Yeah. Okay. So how, if you guys have never seen a horse get worked up for a lameness, uh, this is ideally how it should go. So we go, we feel the horse's legs, see if anything's hot, swollen, sensitive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we watch the horse move. Like I will watch them walk. I'll watch them jog. Um, I'll watch them lunge if I can. We do flexion tests, which is like where you kind of pick up each individual leg and you put stress on the joints and watch them jog off and see if by crunching on a joint, does it make them hurt worse is what you're trying to do. Because the hardest part about our job is they can't tell us, right? Like if I go see your horse, you can't be like, man, doc, my foot's killing me today. You gotta look at this thing. It just doesn't happen. Um, so the way we first try to um, isolate it, because the first thing we gotta do is, the first question is where does the horse hurt? Not why does it hurt, where does it hurt? Because I gotta figure out where, because depending on where it hurts, I do different things. So what we do is, um, let's see here. I'm trying to think if I have a picture that I can use for this. Yeah, suspensor. Okay. So what we do is the horse can't tell us where it hurts, so we got to figure it out. So what we use is typically something called carbocaine, which is like novocaine if you go to the dentist and they numb something for you. Same idea. There are nerves that run all along the legs, top to bottom. And what we do is we put this numbing agent starting low behind the foot. We give them like 10 minutes, then we watch them go again. And if they're better, we can say, aha, if I made the foot start to not feel anything, the horse goes better. So it's gotta be somewhere in the foot. If it doesn't go in the foot, oh, come here mouse. We go a little bit higher. Then we might go above the ankle. Then we'll go to the back of the knee. That's usually as high as you need to go. So you start at the bottom, because remember, this nerve is like a highway, right? That runs all the way down, one continuous thing. So if I block really up high during the, the first thing I do is block back here. I block the whole leg. The whole leg is numb. So you start low and work your way up. So that's how we sequentially figure out where it hurts. Because again, the first, pro, the first thing we have to figure out as vets is where does it hurt? Because if I know where it hurts, I can figure out why it hurts. So if I, so typically say you have a horse with navicular disease, you block back here in the back of the pastern, it gets the foot numb, most of the foot, like back of the foot, horse goes better. I say, okay, listen guys, the back of the foot is what's making this horse hurt. So the first thing I do is I x-ray it because it's, it's simple to do. We can do it on the farm. And a lot of times you can get good information from it. Um, but again, if the foot doesn't do it, then I go higher, then I go higher, then I go higher. I've blocked all the way up to the shoulder. I've blocked the horse's foot, ankle, back of the knee, the knee, the elbow, and then the shoulder. You can block all the way up the limb. But that's how you figure out where it is. Once you figure out where it is, then you try to figure out the why. You know, everyone would say, why is my horse lame? My first question is, where is your horse lame? Like, what, where is the pain coming from? Because then I can figure out what to do. Because, um, you know, if I, you know, some things are easy to feel, right? Like if your horse all of a sudden has a big bow on the back of its tendon, you're probably going to ultrasound it right off the bat. But that's not, that's not how it usually goes. A lot of times there's not a lot of heat or there's not a lot of swelling. And so you have to figure out where it's hurting first, and then you go from there and you just sequentially work up. And that goes for the front and the back leg. You keep working up and up and up. And when you hit a point where after you make it numb, the horse goes better, you say, aha, I have to look there. Whether it's an x-ray or an ultrasound or an MRI or whatever, you go, okay, I got to look there. I got to figure out what's going on there. Does that kind of answer your question? I hope. Yes. Okay. But that's how we have to do it. There, again, there are some things that you can figure out fairly 
efficiently by looking at it. Again, if, if the horse didn't have a big bow thing on the back of its leg yesterday and all of a sudden it's there and it's hot and it's swollen, I'm going to say, hey, listen, Madison, we should ultrasound this. But that doesn't always happen. you know. So I had a horse the other day in the clinic that was lame when you lunged it. Wasn't too bad on the straightaway. I blocked the back of the foot. It didn't do anything. I blocked underneath the ankle. It didn't do anything. I blocked above the ankle. It kind of got a little bit better. I blocked behind the knee. Perfect. Horse moved perfect. So I ended up ultrasounding the suspensory and it had hurt its suspensory, the main body part. Actually hurt it right behind the knee. It pulled a piece of bone off. So that's how you figure out where to look. Like I said, usually you end up stopping here most of the time it's frustrating because you don't you you can't just figure out where it is by looking at it. so you have to do this numbing thing to try and figure out where it's at and it's not as exact science you know sometimes if you do the foot it doesn't get the front of the foot so you have to go up higher um, if the horse has got something really bad going on inside the foot sometimes you have to go all the way up to the ankle to block it um, so there's not there's guidelines of how to do it, but the more you do this, the more you learn things don't always go the right way. I've had lamenesses where the horse is obviously lame and has a head nod. I block all the way up to the back of the knee, can't make it any better. I come back in three days, I block it to the foot first time. Like it's the most frustrating thing ever as a, as a, a veterinarian that does lameness stuff. Um, but that's how you figure out, is it up or is it low? is the numbing. The numbing is our way of the horse saying, that's where it's at, doc. You got to figure out what that is. That's how we get them to talk to us is by, if I make it numb and you look way happier, then I know where to look. And that's why I need to know first is where to look. I just stepped on my cat. Sorry, Muffin. It's very angry. Anybody else got questions? Don't worry, she's fine. She's fine. What are the most common types of arthritis you see? Uh, so the hawk arthritis or bone spavin is a very common place to see it across the board. Uh, hunters, jumpers, eventers, dressage, quarter horses, very common. Um, arthritis in the knees and racehorses, they, they, they put a lot of stress on their knees. So you'll commonly see arthritis in their knees. Uh, ankles is another common spot. Again, the ring bone, both high and low, aren't as commonly seen as, say, the hawks, um, but you can find it. Um, stifles uh, can, especially in like Western performance horses, they use their rear end a lot. Um, you can get arthritis in the stifles. So, but your hawk is probably one of your, is probably the highest on the list, I would say. I can pick any breed, any discipline, and I can probably find arthritis in the hawk. And it varies. And just because they have arthritis doesn't mean they have to be lame. Um, and doesn't mean they have to have problems, but they can still have it there. And then like the shoulder and the elbow would be pretty low on the list. Um, they can get arthritis in their neck. Remember that's a long neck, right? Um, they can get arthritis in their neck. Uh, and so that can cause problems too. So that's really fun to try and figure out. Um, that's one of those ones where you may block all the way up the leg and they don't get better. So, uh, but yeah, hawks for sure, number one. What else? Any good questions out there roaming around? Did we, hit the, did we hit the bottom of the, of the question pool now? I have no idea. You guys asked a lot of really great questions. Yeah, super. So. Not necessarily what we talked about, but those are, well, those are really good questions. Like I said, there's so much lameness stuff out there. I mean, I think this was a good list for you guys because I think these are things we're going to probably commonly run across as you know, members of 4-H, as horse owners, as riders, as trainers, you know, the hawk arthritis, the navicular disease, um, the suspensory and the, and the tendon injuries. Um, you know, the, the laminitis founder one would have been a good one to throw in there too. Uh, if we ever do this again, that'd be a good little one to do. 
you could literally do, I mean, you understand like there's people that devote their careers to, to researching that and all the intricacies of it, how you treat it, how you shoe for it, how you prevent it, what diseases cause it. Um, but you know, that was a good one to ask questions on. Um, but I think this overall was a pretty good, uh, again, those more, I'll say, quote unquote, typical uh, things that you may run across. Or again, the ones that aren't even necessarily really bad lameness ones, like the splint or the curb or the side bones. Well, those things you may run across for sure. Like those are not uncommon things to see, but that doesn't mean they're terrible. It just means they're, they're, they're common. So I think that was, a, that was a good list, but those are good questions of not stuff on that list um, that you do run across. The wind puffs, whoever asked that question, that was a good question. Um, the laminitis, like I said, that was, a, again, that could be a whole topic on its own. Um, there's a couple other good questions in there you guys asked though. And the shoulder and the elbow question was a good question too. Uh, I mean, cause again, you, you think big giant horse, big giant joints, but uh, fortunately, again, fortunately, uh, they don't have as many problems in that area. Thank goodness. Especially from an orthopedic standpoint. You guys bottomed out on a Friday night. And remember you guys, if you have any questions, you can just email and we can pass them on or anything if you think of anything between now and when you go to sleep. <laughs> or when you wake up. Yes. Um, yeah. So just let us know if you have any questions. I think that was that was great. So thank you very much for that presentation. I think that was very thorough and I think everyone got something from that. Yeah, I try to put as many pictures of stuff, especially like the blemish stuff. I know some like the MRI stuff was kind of like, I didn't expect you to know how to read an MRI, but I just figured it'd be kind of for you guys cool to see that because you might not always see that. But I mean, that's that's stuff that we kind of do every day, uh, especially if you're doing lameness stuff. I mean, the ultrasounding, the x-raying, the MRIs, I mean, these are not uncommon things that we do. MRI, not quite as much, but there'll be sometimes that we do six or seven MRIs in a week at our practice. Definitely the x-ray and the ultrasound happens more commonly. I mean, every day I probably x-ray between two to six horses a day. Um, so at least you can see those things a little bit. I hope they kind of made sense in some way, shape or form. You could follow them. Ultrasounds are for sure the hardest, 100%. Ultrasounds the hardest thing to understand, comprehend and do. It just is because it's, it's, it's just an art more than like a point and x-ray and shoot but i'm sure all you guys have seen some sort of foot x-ray and stuff like that too for some reason or other yep okay all right well thank you and thank you guys for getting on too yeah thank you guys very much for joining us and we'll let you guys go on your friday night <laughs> thank you all right thank all you right, bye guys have a good one bye Thank you so much. You're welcome.